Welcome to my book nook. Welcome back to the book nook. With um, we're just starting out. This is the second episode of the Book Thief by Marcus Suzak. And remember, it's being narrated by the Grim Reaper, and it's telling about Liesel. Uh, what we learned in the last episode was that she was sent to a foster home, the Hubermans, um, which has presented its own struggles. Um, but let's start in. This is, we're on page 46. It's not, I mean, the chapters are titled but not numbered, so it's page 46. It's called The Kiss, A Childhood Decision Maker. As with most small towns, Mulching was filled with characters. A handful of them lived on Himmel Street. Frau Holtzoffel was only one cast member. The others included the likes of these. Rudy Steiner, the boy next door who was obsessed with the black American athlete Jesse Owens. Frau Diller, the staunch Aryan corner shop owner. Tommy Mueller, a kid whose chronic ear infections had resulted in several operations, a pink river of skin painted across his face in a tendency to twitch. A man known primarily as Fif Fificus, whose vulgarity made Rosa Huberman look like a wordsmith and a saint. On the whole, it was a street filled with relatively poor people, despite the apparent rise of Germany's econ economy under Hitler. Poor sides of town still existed. As mentioned earlier, the house next door to the Hubermans was rented by a family called Steiner. The Steiners had six children. One of them, the infamous Rudy, would soon become Liesel's best friend, and later her partner and sometime catalyst in crime. She met him on the street. A few days after Liesel's first bath, Mama allowed her out to play with the other kids. On Himmel Street, friendships were made outside no matter the weather. The children rarely visited each other's homes, for they were small and there were usually very little in them. Also, they conducted their favorite pastime, like professionals, on the street. Soccer. Teams were well set. Garbage cans were used to mark out the goals. Being the new kid in town, Liesel was immediately shoved between one pair of those cans. Tommy Mueller was finally set free, despite being the most useless so soccer player Himmel Street had ever seen. It all went nicely for a while until the fateful moment when Rudy Steiner was upended in the snow by a Tommy Mueller foul of frustration. What? Time Tommy shouted. His face twitched in desperation. What did I do? A penalty was awarded by everyone on Rudy's team, and now it was Rudy Steiner against the new kid, Liesl Miminger. He placed the ball on a grubby mound of snow, confident of the usual outcome. After all, Rudy hadn't missed a penalty in 18 shots, even when the opposition made a point of booting Tommy Mueller out of goal. No matter whom they replaced with him, Rudy would score. On this occasion, they tried to force Liesl out. As you might imagine, she protested and Rudy agreed. No, no, he smiled. Let her stay. He was rubbing his hands together. Snow had stopped falling on the filthy street now, and the muddy footprints were gathered between them. Rudy shuffled in, fired the shot, and Liesel dived and somehow deflected it with her elbow. She stood up, grinning, but the first thing she saw was a snowball smashing into her face. Half of it was mud. It stung like crazy. How do you like that? The boy grinned, and he ran off in pursuit of the ball. Soccer, Lisa Liesel whispered. The vocabulary of her new home was catching on fast. Some facts about Rudy Steiner. He was eight months older than Liesel and had bony legs, sharp teeth, gangly blue eyes, and hair the color of a lemon. One of six Steiner children, he was permanently hungry. On Himmel Street, he was considered a little crazy. This was on account of an event that was rarely spoken about but widely regarded as the Jesse Owens incident, in which he painted himself charcoal black and ran the hundred meters at the local playing field one night. Insane or not, Rudy was always destined to be Liesel's best friend. A snowball in the face is surely the perfect beginning to a lasting friendship. A few days after Liesel started school, she went along with the Steiners. Rudy's mother, Barbara, made him promise to walk with the new girl, mainly because she had heard about the snowball. 
To Rudy's credit, he was happy enough to comply. He was not the junior misogynistic type of boy at all. He liked girls a lot. And he liked Liesel, hence the snowball. In fact, Rudy Steiner was one of those audacious little bastards who actually fancied himself with the ladies. Every childhood seems to have exactly such a juvenile and in, in its midst and miss. He's the boy who refuses to fear the opposite sex purely because everyone else embraces that particular fear. And he's the type who is unafraid to make a decision. In this case, Rudy had already made up his mind about Liesel Miminger. On the way to school, he tried to point out certain landmarks in the town, or at least he managed to slip it all in, somewhere between telling his younger siblings to shut their faces and the older ones telling him to shut his. His first point of interest was a small window on the second floor of an apartment block. That's where Tommy Mueller lives, he realized that Liesel didn't remember him. The Twitcher! When he was five years old, he got lost at the markets on the coldest day of the year. Three hours later, when they found him, he was frozen solid and had an awful earache from that cold. After a while, his ears were all infected inside, and he had three or four operations, and the doctors wrecked his nerves. So now he twitches. Liesel chimed in, and he's bad at soccer. The worst. Next was the corner shop at the end of Himmel Street, Frau Diller's. An important note about Frau Diller. She had one golden rule. Frau Diller, Frau Diller was a sharp-edged woman with fat glasses and a nefarious glare. She developed this e evil look to discourage the very idea of stealing from her shop, which she occupied with soldier-like posture, a refrigerated voice and even breath that smelled like Heil Hitler. The shop itself was white and cold and completely bloodless. The small house compressed between, beside it shivered with a little more severity than the other buildings on Himmel Street. Frau Diller administered this feeling, dishing it out as the only free item from her premises. She lived for her shop, and her shop lived for the Third Reich. Even with rationing started later in the year, she was known to sell certain hard-to-get items under the counter and donate the money to the Nazi party. On the wall behind her usual sitting position was a framed photo of the Fuhrer. If you walked into her shop and didn't say, Heil Hitler, you wouldn't be served. As they walked by, Rudy drew Liesel's attention to the bulletproof eyes leering from the shop window. Say Heil when you go in there, he warned her stiffly, unless you want to walk a little farther. Even when they were well past the shop, Liesel looked back and the magnif magnified eyes were still there fastened to the window. Around the corner, Munich Street, the main road in and out of mul mulching, was strewn with slosh. As was often the case, a few rows of troops in training came ma marching past. Their uniforms walked upright, and their black boots further polluted the snow. Their faces were fixed ahead in concentration. Once they'd watched the soldiers disappear, the group of Steiners and Liesel walked past some shop windows and the imposing town hall, which in later years would be chopped off at the knees and buried. A few of the shops were abandoned and still labeled with yellow stars and anti-Jewish slurs. Farther down, the church aimed itself at the sky, its rooftop a, st a study of collaborated tiles. The street, overall, was a lengthy tube of gray, a corridor of dampness, people stooped in the cold, and the splash sound of watery footsteps. At one stage, Rudy rushed ahead, dragging Liesel with him. He knocked on the window of a tailor's shop. He had been able to read the signs. She would have noticed that it belonged to Rudy's father, had she been able to read the signs. The shop was not yet open, but inside a man was preparing articles of clothing behind the counter. He looked up and waved. My papa, Rudy informed her, and they were soon among a crowd of various sized diners each waving or blowing kisses at their father, or simply standing and nodding hello in the case of the oldest ones, then moving on toward the final landmark before school, the last stop, the Road of Yellow Stars. It was a place nobody wanted to stay and look at, but almost everyone did. Shaped like a long, broken arm, the road contained several houses with lacerated windows and bruised walls. The Star of David was painted on their doors. Those houses were almost like lepers. At the very least, they were infected sores on the injured German terrain. 
Schielerstrasse, Rudy said, the road of yellow stars. At the bottom, some people were moving around. The drizzle made them look like ghosts, not humans, but shapes moving about beneath the lead-colored clouds. Come on, you two, Kurt, the oldest of the Steiner children, called back, and Rudy and Liesel walked quickly toward him. At school, Rudy made a special point of seeking Liesel out during the breaks. He didn't care that others made noises about the new girl's stupidity. He was there for her at the beginning, and he wouldn't he would be there later on when Liesel's frustration boiled over. But he wouldn't do it for free. The only thing worse than a boy who hates you a boy who loves you. In late April, when they'd returned from school for the day, Rudy and Liesel waited on Himmel Street for the usual game of soccer. They were slightly early and no other, no other kids had turned up yet. The one person they saw was the gutter mouth Fithkus. Look there, Rudy pointed. A portrait of Fithkus. He was a delicate frame. He was white hair. He was a black raincoat, brown pants, decomposing shoes, and a mouth. And what a mouth it was. Hey, Fithkus! As the distant figure turned, Rudy started whistling. The old man simultaneously straightened and proceeded to swear with a ferocity that can only be described as a talent. No one seemed to know the real name that belonged to him, or at least if they did, they never used it. He was only called Fifficus because you gave that name to someone who likes to whistle, which Fifficus most definitely did. He was constantly whistling a tune called the Radetsky March, and all the kids in town would call out to him and duplicate that tune. At that precise moment, Fifficus would abandon his usual walking style, bent forward, talking large, taking large, lanky steps, arms behind his raincoat of black, and erect himself to deliver abuse. It was then that an impression of serenity was violently interrupted, for his voice was brimming with rage. On this occasion, Liesel followed Rudy's taunt almost as a reflex action. Fificus, she echoed, quickly adopting the appropriate cr cruelty that children seemed to require. Her whistling was awful, but there was no time to perfect it. He chased them, calling out. It started with, Geshishin, and deteriorated rapidly from there. At first, he leveled his abuse only at the boy, but soon enough, it was Liesel's turn. You little slut, he roared at her. The words clobbered her in the back. I've never seen you before. Fancy calling a ten-year-old a girl a slut. That was Vipicus. It was widely agreed that he and Frau Holtz of Apfel would have made a lovely couple. Get back here, were the last words Liesel and Rudy heard as they continued running. They ran until they were on Munich Street. Come on, Rudy said once they recovered their breath, just down here a little. He took her to Hubert Oval, the scene of the Jesse Owens incident, where they stood, hands in pockets. The track was stretched out in front of them. Only one thing could happen. Rudy started it. Hundred meters, he goaded her. I bet you can't beat me. Liesel wasn't taking any of that. I bet you I can. What do you bet, you little sawminch? Have you got any money? Of course not. Do you? No. But Rudy had an idea. It was the lover boy coming out of him. If I beat you, I get to kiss you. He crouched down and began rolling up his trousers. Liesel was alarmed to put it mildly. What do you want to kiss me for? I'm filthy. So am I. Rudy clearly saw no reason why a bit of filth should get in the way of things. It had been a while between baths for both of them. She thought about it while examining the weedy legs of her opposition. They were about equal with her own. There's no way he can beat me, she thought. She nodded seriously. This was business. You can kiss me if you win, but if I win, I get out of being goalie at soccer. Rudy considered it. Fair enough. And they shook on it. All was dark-skied and hazy and small chips of rain were starting to fall. The track was muddier than it looked. Both competitors were set. Rudy threw a rock in the air as the starting pistol. When it hit the ground, they could start running. I can't even see the finish line, Liesel complained. And I can? The rock wedged itself into the earth. They ran next to each other, elbowing and trying to get in front. The slippery ground slurped at their feet and brought them down perhaps 20 meters from the end. 
Jesus, Mary and Joseph, yelped Rudy, I'm covered in shit. It's not shit, Liesl corrected him, it's mud. Although she had her doubts that slid another five meters toward the finish. Do we call it a draw then? Rudy looked over, all sharp teeth and gangly blue eyes, half his face was painted with mud. If it's a draw, do I still get my kiss? Not in a million years, Liesl stood up and flicked some mud off her jacket. I'll get you out of goalie. Stick your goalie. As they walked back to Hummel Street, Rudy forewarned her. One day, Liesl, he said, you'll be dying to kiss me. But Liesl knew. She vowed. As long as both she and Rudy Steiner lived, she would never kiss that miserable, filthy soccerel. Especially not this day. They were more important matters to attend to. She looked down at her suit of mud and st studied at the obvious. She's going to kill me. She, of course, was Rosa Huberman, also known as Mama, and she very nearly did kill her. The word Samich featured heavily in the administration of punishment. She made mincemeat out of her. The Jesse Owens Incident As we both know, Liesl wasn't on hand on Himmel Street when Rudy performed his act of childhood infamy. When she looked back, though, it felt like she'd actually been there. In her memory, she had somehow become a member of Rudy's imaginary audience. Nobody else mentioned it, but Rudy certainly made up for that. So much that when Liesl came to collect, recollect her story, the Jesse Owens incident was as much a part of it as everything she witnessed firsthand. It was 1936, the Olympics, Hitler's Games. Jesse Owens had just completed the four time the four time 100 meter relay and won his fourth gold medal talk that he was subhuman because he was black and hitler's refusal to shake his hand were touted around the world even the most racist germans were amazed with the efforts of owens and word of his feet slipped through the cracks no one was more impressed than rudy steiner Everyone in his family was crowded together in their family room when he slipped out and made his way to the kitchen. He pulled some charcoal from the stove and gripped in it the smallness of his hands. Now there was a smile. He was ready. He smeared the charcoal on nice and thick till he was covered in black. Even his hair received a once-over. In the window, the boy grinned almost maniacally at his reflection, and in his shorts and tank top, he quietly abducted his older brother's bike and pedaled it up the street, heading for Hubert Oval. In one of his pockets, he had hidden a few pieces of extra charcoal, in case some of it wore off later. In Liesel's mind, the moon was sewn into the sky that night. Clouds were stitched around it. The rusty bike crumpled to a halt at the Hubert Oval's fence line, and Rudy climbed over. He landed on the other side and trotted weedily up toward the beginning of the hundred. Enthusiastically, he conducted an awkward regimen of stretches. He dug starting holes into the dirt. Waiting for his moment, he paced around, gathering concentration under the darkness sky and the moon and the clouds watching tightly. Owens is looking good, he began to commentate. This could be his greatest victory ever. He shook the imaginary hands of the other athletes and wished them luck, even though he knew they didn't have a chance. The starter signaled them forward. A crowd materialized around every square inch of Hubert Oval's circumference. They were all calling out one thing. They were chanting Rudy Steiner's name, and his name was Jesse Owens. All fell silent. His bare feet gripped the soil. He could feel it holding on between his toes. At the request of the starter, he raised to crouching position, and the gun clipped a hole in the night. For the first third of the race, it was pretty even, but it was only a matter of time before the charcoal Owens drew clear and streaked away. Owens in front, the boy's shrill voice cried as he ran down the empty track, straight toward the uproarious applause of Olympic glory. He could even feel the tape break in two across his chest as he burst through it in first place the fastest man alive. It was only on his victory lap that things turned sour. Among the crowd, his father was standing at the finish line like the boogeyman, or at least the boogeyman in a suit. As previously mentioned, Rudy's father was a tailor. He was rarely seen on the street without a suit and tie. On this occasion, it was only the suit and a disheveled shirt. Was it slow? 
he said to his son when he showed up in his charcoal glory. What the hell is going on here? The crowd vanished. A breeze sprang up. I was asleep in my chair when Kurt noticed you were gone. Everyone's out looking for you. Mr. Steiner was a remarkably polite man under normal circumstances. Discovering one of his children smeared charcoal black on a summer evening was not what he considered normal circumstances. The boy is crazy, he muttered. Although he conceded that which six kids that with six kids something like this was bound to happen. At least one of them had to be a bad egg. Right now, he was looking at it, waiting for an explanation. Well, Rudy panted, bending down and placing his hands on his knees. I was being Jesse Owens, he answered as though it was the most natural thing on earth to be doing. There was even something implicit in his tone that suggested something along the lines of, what the hell does it look like? The tone vanished, however, when he saw the sleep deprivation whittled under his father's eyes. Jesse Owens? Mr. Steiner was the type of man who was very wooden. His voice was angular and true. His body was tall and heavy like oak. His hair was like splinters. What about him? You know, Papa, the black magic one. I'll give you black magic. He caught his son's ears between his thumb and forefinger. Rudy winced. Ow, that really hurts. Does it? His father was more concerned with the clammy texture of coal charcoal contaminating his fingers. He covered everything, didn't he, he thought. It's even in his ears, for God's sake. Come on. On the way home, Mr. Steiner decided to talk politics with the boy as best he could. Only in the years ahead would Rudy understand it all, when it was too late to bother understanding anything. The Contradictory Politics of Alex Steiner Point one, he was a member of the Nazi party, but he did not hate the Jews, or anyone else for that matter. Part two, secretly, though he couldn't help feeling a percentage of relief or worse gladness when Jewish shop owners were put out of their business, propaganda informed him that it was only a matter of time before a plague of Jewish tailors showed up and stole his customers. Point three, but... Did that mean they should be driven out completely? Point four, his family, surely he had to do whatever he could to support them. If that meant being in the party, it meant being in the party. And point five, somewhere far down, there was an itch in his heart, but he made it a point not to scratch it. He was afraid of what might leak out. They walked around a few corners onto Himmel Street, and Alex said, son, you can't go around painting yourself black, you hear? Rudy was interested and confused. The moon was undone now, free to move and rise and fall and drip on the boy's face, making him nice and murky like his thoughts. Why not, Papa? Because they'll take you away. Why? Because you shouldn't want to be like black people or Jewish people or anyone who is, who is not us. Who are Jewish people? You know my oldest customer, Mr. Kaufman? Where we bought your shoes? Yes. Well, he's Jewish. I didn't know that. Do you have to pay to be Jewish? Do you need a license? No, Rudy. Mr. Steiner was steering the bike with one hand and Rudy with the other. He was having trouble steering the conversation. He still hadn't relinquished the hold on his son's earlobe. He'd forgotten about it. It's like you're German or, or, or Catholic. Oh, is Jesse Owens Catholic? I don't know. He tripped on a bike pedal then and released the ear. They walked on in silence for a while until Rudy said, I just wish I was like Jesse Owens, Papa. This time, Mr. Steiner placed his hand on Rudy's head and explained, I know, son, but you've got beautiful blonde hair and big safe blue eyes. You should be happy with that. Is that clear? But nothing was clear. Rudy understood nothing, and that night was the prelude of things to come. Two and a half years later, the Kaufman shoe shop was reduced to broken glass, and all the shoes were flung aboard a truck in their boxes. The Other Side of Sandpaper People have defining moments, I suppose, especially when they're children. For some, it's a Jesse Owens incident. For others, it's a, mo a moment of bedwetting hysteria. It was late May 1939, and the idea had been, like most others, Mama shook her iron fist. Papa was out. Lisa cleaned the front door and watched the Himmel Street sky. Earlier, there had been a parade. 
the brown-shirted extremist members of the NSDAP, otherwise known as the Nazi Party, had marched down Munich Street, their ban banners worn proudly, their faces held high as if on sticks. Their voices were full of song, culminating in a roaring rendition of Deutschland über alles, Germany over everything. As always, they were clapped. They were spurred on as they walked to who knows where. People on the street stood and watched, some with straight-armed salutes, others with hands that burned from applause. Some kept faces that were contorted by pride and rally like fraud dealer. And then there were the scatterings of odd men out, like Alex Steiner, who stood like a human-shaped block of wood, clapping slowly and dutifully, and beautiful submission. On the footpath, Lisa stood with her papa and Rudy. Hans Huberman wore a face with the shades pulled down. Some crunched numbers. In 1933, 90% of Germans showed unflinching support for Adolf Hitler. That leaves 10% who didn't. Hans Huberman belonged to the 10%. There was a reason for that. In the night, Liesel dreamed like she always did. At first, she saw the brown shirts marching, but soon enough, they led her to a train, and the usual discovery awaited. Her brother was starting again. When she woke up screaming, Liesel knew immediately that on this occasion something had changed. A smell leaked out from under the sheets, warm and sickly. At first she tried convincing herself that nothing had happened, but as Papa came closer and held her, she cried and admitted the fact in his ear. Papa, she whispered, Papa, and that was all. He could probably smell it. He lifted her gently from the bed and carried her into the washroom. The moment came a few minutes later. We'll take the sheets off, Papa said. And when he reached under a, and pulled at the fabric, something loosened and landed with a thud. A black book with silver writing on it came hurtling out and landed on the floor between the tall men's feet. He looked down at it. He looked at the girl who timidly shrugged. Then he read the title with concentration aloud, The Grave Digger's Hand a Book? So that's what it's called, Liesel thought. A patch of silence stood among them now. The man, the girl, the book. He picked it up and spoke soft as cotton. A 2 a.m. conversation. Is this yours? Yes, Papa. Do you want to read it? Again. Yes, Papa. A tired smile, metallic eyes melting. Well, we'd better read it then. Four years later, when she came to write in the basement, two thoughts struck Liesel about the trauma of wetting the bed. First, she felt extremely lucky that it was Papa who discovered the book. Fortunately, when the sheets had been washed previously, Rosa had made Liesel strip the bed and make it up. And be quick about it, Salmanch! Does it look like we've got all day? Secondly, she was clearly pr proud of Hans Huberman's part in her education. You wouldn't think it, she wrote, but it was not so much the school who helped me to read. It was Papa. People think he's not so smart, and it's true that he doesn't read too fast. But I would soon learn that words and writing actually saved his life once, or at least words and a man who taught him the accordion. First things first, Hans Huberman said that night. He washed the sheets and hung them up. Now, he said upon his return, let's get this midnight class started. The yellow light was alive with dust. Liesel sat on cold, clean sheets, ashamed, elated. The thought of bedwetting prodded her, but she was going to read. She was going to read the book. The excitement stood up in her. Visions of a ten-year-old reading genius were set alight. If only it was that easy. To tell you the truth, Papa explained up front, I'm not such a good reader myself. But it didn't matter that he read slowly. If anything, it might have helped that his own reading pace was slower than average. Perhaps it would cause less frustration in coping with the girl's lack of ability. Still, initially, Hans appeared a little uncomfortable holding the book and looking through it. When he came over and sat next to her on the bed, he leaned back, his legs angling over the side. He examined the book again and dropped it on the blanket. Now why would a nice girl like you want to read such a thing? Again, Liesel shrugged. Had the apprentice been reading the complete works of Goethe or any other such luminary that was what would have sat in front of them? She attempted to explain. I, 
when when it was sitting in the snow and the soft-spoken words fell off the side of the bed emptying to the floor like powder papa knew what to say though he always knew what to say he ran a hand through his sleepy hair and said well promise me well, promise me one thing lisa if i die any time soon you make sure they bury me right she nodded with great sincerity no skipping chapter six or step four in chapter nine he laughed as did the bedwetter well i'm glad that's settled we can get on with it now he adjusted his position and his bones creaked like itchy floorboards the fun begins amplified by the still of night the book opened a gust of wind looking back liesel could tell exactly what her papa was thinking when he scanned the first page of the grave digger's handbook as he realized the difficulty of the text, he was clearly aware that such a book was hardly ideal. There were words in there that he'd have trouble with himself, not to mention the morbidity of the subject. As for the girl, there was a sudden desire to read it that she didn't even attempt to understand. On some level, perhaps she wanted to make sure her brother was buried right. Whatever the reason, her hunger to read the book was as intense as any ten-year-old human could experience. Chapter 1 was called The First Step, Choosing the Right Equipment. In a short introductory passage, it outlined the kind of material to be covered in the following 20 pages. Types of shovels, picks, gloves, and so forth were itemized, as well as the vital needs to properly maintain them. This grave digging was serious. As Papa flicked through it, he could surely feel Liesel's eyes on him. They reached over and gripped him, waiting for something, anything, to slip from his lips. Here... He shifted again and handed her the book. Look at this page and tell me how many words you can read. She looked at it and lied. About half. Read some for me. But of course she couldn't. When he made her point out any word that she could read and actually say them, there were only three. The three main German words for the, the whole page must have had 200 words on it. This might be harder than I thought. She caught him thinking it, just for a moment. He lifted himself forward, rose to his feet, and walked out. This time he came back and he said, I actually have a better idea. In his hand, there was a thick painter's pencil and a stack of sandpaper. Let's start from scratch. Liesel saw no reason to argue. In the left corner of an upturned piece of sandpaper, he drew a square of paper, a square of perhaps an inch, and shoved a capital A inside it. In the other corner, he placed a lowercase one. So far, so good. A, Liesel said. A for what? She smiled. Awful. He wrote the word in big letters and drew a misshapen apple under it. He was a house painter, not an artist. When it was complete, he looked over and said, now for B. He wrote the word in big letters as they progressed through the alphabet, Liesel's eyes grew larger. She had done this at school in the kindergarten class, but this time was better. She was the only one there, and she was not gigantic. It was nice to watch Papa's hand as, she wrote, as he wrote the words and slowly constructed the primitive sketches. Ah, oh, come on, Liesel, he said when she struggled later on. Something that starts with S. It's easy. I'm very disappointed in you. She couldn't think. Come on, he his whisper played with her. Think of Mama. That was it. That was when the word struck her face like a slap, a reflex grin. So much. She shouted, and Papa roared with laughter, then quieted. Shh, we have to be quiet. But he roared all, all the same and wrote the word, completing it with one of his sketches. A typical Hans Huberman artwork. <laughs> Check that out. Papa, she whispered, I have no eyes. He patted the girl's hair. She had fallen into his trap. With a smile like that, Hans Humerman said, You don't need eyes. He hugged her and then looked again at the picture with a face of warm silver. Now for a tea. With the alphabet completed and studied a dozen times, Papa leaned over and said, Enough for tonight. A few more words. He was definite. Enough. When you wake up, I'll play the accordion for you. 
Thanks, Papa. Good night. A quiet one syllable laugh. Good night, Salmonch. Good night, Papa. He switched off the light, came back and sat in the chair. In the darkness, Le Liesl kept her eyes open. She was watching the words. The smell of friendship. It continued over the next few weeks and into summer. The midnight class began at the end of each nightmare. There were two more bedwetting occurrences, but Hans Huberman merely repeated his previous clean-up heroics and got down to the task of reading, sketching, and reciting. In the morning's early hours, quiet voices were loud. On a Thursday, just after 3 p.m., Mama told Liesel to get ready to come with her and deliver some ironing. Papa had other ideas. He walked into the kitchen and said, Sorry, Mama, she's not going with you today. Mama didn't even bother looking up from the washing bag. Who asked you, arsehole? Arslok? Come on, Liesel. She's reading, he said. Papa handed Liesel a steadfast smile and a wink. With me, I'm teaching her. We're going to the ap amper upstream where I used to practice the accordion. Now he had her attention. Mama placed the washing on the table and eagerly worked herself up to the appropriate level of cynicism. What did you say? I think you heard me, Rosa. Mama laughed. What the hell could you teach her? A cardboard grin, uppercut words, like you could read so much, you sucker out. The kitchen waited and Papa counterpunched. We'll take your ironing for you. You filthy, she stopped. The words propped in her mouth as she considered it. Be back before dark. We can't read in the dark, Mama, Liesel said. What's that, Salmonch? Nothing, Mama. Papa grinned and pointed at the girl. Book, sandpaper, pencil. He ordered her, and accordion. Once she was already gone, soon they were on Himmel Street, carrying the words, the music, the washing. As they walked toward Fra Dillers, they turned around a few times to see if Mama was still at the gate checking on them. She was. At one point, she called out, Liesel, hold that ironing straight. Don't crease it. Yes, Mama. A few steps later, Liesel, are your dress warm enough? What did you say? Some inch trickage. You never hear anything. Are your dress warm enough? It might get cold later. Around the corner, Papa bent down to do up a shoelace. Liesel, he said, could you roll me a cigarette? Nothing would give her greater pleasure. Once the ironing was delivered, they made their way back to the Amper River, which flanked the town. It worked its way past pointing in the direction of Dachau, Dachau the concentration camp. There was a wooden plank bridge. They sat, they sat maybe 30 meters down from it, in the grass, writing the words and reading them aloud. And when darkness was near, Hans pulled out the accordion. Liesel looked at him and listened. She did not immediately notice the perplexed expression on Papa's face that evening as he played. Papa's face. It's traveled and wondered, but it disclosed no answers. Not yet. There had been a change in him, a slight shift. She saw it, but didn't realize until later when all the stories came together. She didn't see him watching as he played, having no idea that Hans Huberman's accordion was a story. In the times ahead, they would arrive at 30, that story would arrive at 33 Himmel Street in the early hours of morning, wearing ruffled shoulders and a shivering jacket. It would carry a suitcase, a book, and two questions. A story, story after story, story within story. For now, there was only one as far as Liesel was concerned, and she was enjoying it. She settled into the long arms of grass lying back, she closed her eyes and her ears held the notes. There were, of course, some problems as well. A few times Papa nearly yelled at her. Come on, Liesel, he'd say. You know this word, you know it. Just when progress seemed to be flowing well, somehow things would become lodged. When the weather was good, they'd go to the amper in the afternoon. In bad weather, it was the basement. This was mainly on account of Mama. At first they tried in the kitchen, but there was no way. Rosa, Hans said to her at one point, Quietly, her words cut through one of her, her sentences. Could you do me a favor? She looked up from the store. What? I'm asking you. I am begging you. Could you please shut your mouth for five minutes? You can imagine the reaction. They ended up in the basement. 
There was no lighting there, so they took a kerosene lamp and slowly between school and home, from the river to the basement, from the good days to the bad, Liesel was learning to read and write. Soon, Papa told her, you'll be able to read that awful graves book with your eyes closed, and I can get out of that midget class. She spoke those words with a grim kind of ownership. In one of their basement sessions, Papa dispensed with the sandpaper. It was running out fast, and he pulled out a brush. There were a few luxuries in the Huberman's household, but there was an oversupply of paint, and it became more than useful for Liesel's learning. Papa would say a word, and the girl would have to spell it aloud and then paint it on the wall. As long as she got it right, after a month the wall was recoded, a fresh cement page. Some nights, after working in the basement, Lisa would sit crouched in the bath and hear the same utterances from the kitchen. You stink, Mama would say to Hans, like cigarettes and kerosene. Sitting in the water, she imagined the smell of it, mapped out on her Papa's clothes. More than anything, it was the smell of friendship. She could find it on herself, too. Liesel loved that smell. She would sniff her arm and smile as the water cooled around her. The heavyweight champion of the schoolyard. The summer of 39 was in a hurry, or perhaps Liesel was. She spent her time playing soccer with Rudy and the other kids on Himmel Street, a year-round pastime, taking ironing around with Mama and learning words. It felt like it was over a few days after it began. In the latter part of the year, two things happened. September through November, 1939. Number one, World War II begins. And number two, Liesel Memminger becomes the heavyweight champion of the schoolyard. The beginning of September. It was a cool day in mulching when the war began and my workload increased. The world talked it over. Newspaper headlines reveled in it. The Führer's voice roared from German radios. We will not give up. We will not rest. We will be victorious. Our time has come. The German invasion of Poland had begun and people were gathered everywhere listening to the news of it. Munich Street, like every other street in Germany, was alive with war. The smell, the voice, rationing had begun a few days earlier. The writing on the wall. And now it was official. England and France had made their declaration on Germany to steal a phrase from Hans Huberman. The fun begins. The day of the announcement, Papa was lucky enough to have some work. On his way home, he picked up a discarded newspaper, and rather than stopping to shove it between paint cans in his car, he folded it up and slipped it beneath his shirt. By the time he made it home and removed it, his sweat had drawn the ink onto his skin. The paper landed on the table, but the news was stapled to his chest. A tattoo. Holding the shirt open, he looked down in the unsure kitchen light. What does it say? Liesel asked him. She was looking back and forth from the black outlines on the skin to his paper. Hitler takes Poland, he answered, and Hans Huberman slumped into a chair. Deutschland über alles, he whispered, and his voice was not remotely patriotic. The face was there again, his accordion face. There was one war. This, that was one war started. Liesel would soon be in another. Nearly a month after school resumed, she was moved up to her rightful year level. You might think this was due to improved reading, but it wasn't. Despite the advancement, she, was, she still read with great difficulty. Sentences were strewn everywhere where words fooled her. The reason she was elevated had more to do with the fact that she became disruptive in the younger class. She answered questions directed to other children and called out. A few times she was given what was known as washum. Oh, pronounced Vartchen, Vartchen, in the corridor. A definition, Vartchen, a good hiding. She was taken up, put in a chair at the side, and told to keep her mouth shut by the teacher, who also happened to be a nun. At the other end of the classroom, Rudy looked across and waved. Liesel waved back and tried not to smile. At home, she was well into reading the grave digger's handbook with Papa. They would circle the words she couldn't understand and take them down to the basement the next day. She thought it was enough. It was not enough. Somewhere at the start of November, there were some progress tests at school. One of them was for reading. Every child was made to stand at the front of the room and read from a passage the teacher gave them. It was a frosty morning, but bright with sun. 
Children scrunched their eyes. A halo surrounded the Grim Reaper nun. Sister Maria. By the way, I like this idea of the Grim Reaper. I like this guy. It amuses me. In the heavy sun classroom, names were rattled off at random. Waldenheim, Lehman, Steiner. They all stood up and did a reading, all at different levels of capability. Rudy was surprisingly good. Throughout the test, Liesel sat with a mixture of hot anticipation and excruciating fear. She wanted desperately to measure herself to find out once and for all how her learning was advancing. Was she up to it? Could she even come close to Rudy and the rest of them? Each time Sister Maria looked at her list, a string of nerves tightened in Liesel's ribs. It started in her stomach, but it worked its way up. Soon, soon it would be around her neck, thick as a rope. When Tommy Mueller finished his mediocre attempt, she looked around the room. Everyone had read. She was the last one. Very good, Sister Maria nodded, perusing the list. That's everyone. <laughs> what? No. A voice practically appeared on the other side of the room. Attached to it was a lemon-haired boy whose bony knees knocked in his pants under the desk. He stretched his hands up and said, Sister Maria, I think you forgot Liesel. Sister Maria was not impressed. She plonked her folder on the table in front of her and inspected Rudy with sighing disapproval. It was almost melancholic. Why, she lamented, did she have to put up with that Rudy Steiner? He simply could not keep his mouth shut. Why, God, why? No, she said with finality. Her small belly leaned forward with the rest of her. I'm afraid Liesel cannot do it, Rudy. The teacher looked across for confirmation. She will read for me later. The girl cleared her throat and spoke with quiet defiance. I can do it now, sister. The majority of other kids watched in silence. A few of them performed their beautiful childhood art of snickering. The sister had had enough. No, you cannot. What are you doing? For Liesel was out of her chair and walking slowly, stiffly toward the front of the room. She picked up the book and opened it to a random page. All right, then, said Sister Maria. You want to do it, do it. Yes, sister. After a quick glance at Rudy, Lisa lowered her eyes and examined the page. When she looked up again, the room was pulled apart and then squashed back together, and all the kids were mashed right before her eyes, and in a moment of brilliance, she imagined herself reading the entire page in faultless fluency, filled triumph. Keyword, imagined. Come on, Lisa. Rudy broke the silence. The book thief looked down again at the words. Come on, Rudy mouthed it this time. Come on, Lisa. Her blood loudened. The sentences blurred. The white page was suddenly written in another tongue, and it didn't help that tears were now forming in her eyes. She couldn't even see the words anymore. And that sun, that awful sun, it burst through the window. The glass was everywhere and shone directly onto the useless girl. It shouted in her face, you can steal a book, but you can't read one. It came to her, a solution. Breathing, breathing. She started to read, but not from the book in front of her. It was something from the Gravedigger's Handbook, Chapter 3. In the event of snow, she'd memorized it from her papa's voice. In the event of snow, she spoke, you must make sure you use a good shovel. You must dig deep. You cannot be lazy. You cannot cut corners. Again, she sucked in a large clump of air. Of course, it is easier to wait for the warmest part of the day when... It ended. The book was snatched from her grasp, and she was told, Liesel, the corridor. And she was given a small vert. I gotta see how to say that again. Vertchen. She could hear them all laughing in the classroom. Between Sister Maria's striking hand, she saw them, all those mashed children, grinning and laughing, bathed in sunshine. Everyone laughing but Rudy. In the break, she was taunted. A boy named Ludwig Schmeichel came up to her with a book. Hey, Liesel, he said to her, I am having trouble with this word. Could you read it for me? He laughed at ten-year-old smugness laughter. You dump cough, you idiot. Clouds were filling in now, big and clumsy, and more kids were calling out to her, watching her seethe. Don't listen to them, Rudy advised. Easy for you to say you're not the stupid one. Nearing the end of the break, the tally of comments stood at 19. By the 20th, she snapped. It was Schmeichel, back 
for more. Come on, Liesel. He stuck her book up, the book under her nose. Help me out, will you? And Liesel helped him out all right. She stood up and took the book from him, and as he smiled over his shoulder at some other kids, she threw it away and kicked him as hard as she could in the vicinity of the groin. Well, as you might imagine, Ludwig Schminkel certainly buckled, and on the way down he was punched in the ear, and when he landed he was set upon. When he was set upon, he was slapped and clawed and obliterated by a girl who was utterly consumed with rage. His skin was so warm and soft, her knuckles and fingers were so frighteningly tough, despite their smallness. You saw, girl! Her voice, too, was able to scratch him. You arslock! Can you spell arslock for me? Oh, how the clouds stumbled in and assembled stupidly in the sky. Great obese clouds, dark and plump, bumping into each other, apologizing, moving on and finding room. Children were there, quick as, well, quick as kids gravitating toward a fight. A stew of arms and legs of shouts and cheers grew thicker around them. They were watching Liesel Memminger give Ludwig Smeichel the hiding of a lifetime. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, a girl commented with a shriek. She's going to kill him. Liesel did not kill him, but she came close. In fact, probably the only thing that stopped her was the twitching, pathetic, grinning face of Tommy Mueller. Still crowded with adrenaline, Liesel caught sight of him, smiling with such absurdity that she dragged him down and started beating him up as well. What are you doing, he wailed, and only then, after the third or fourth slap and a trickle of bright blood from his nose did she stop on her knees she sucked in the air and listened to the groans beneath her she watched the whirlpool of faces left and right and she announced i am not stupid no one argued it was only when everyone moved back inside and sister maria saw the state of blood which minkle and the, that the fight resumed first it was rudy and a few others who bore the brunt of suspicion they were always at each other. Hands? Each boy was ordered, but every pair was clean. I don't believe this, the sister muttered. It can't be. But sure enough, when Liesel stepped forward to show her hands, Ludwig Schmeichel was all over them, rusting by the moment. The corridor, she stated for the second time that day and for the second time that hour, actually. This time, it was not a small version. It was not an average one. This time, it was the mother of all corridor version. One sting of the stick after another so that Liesel would barely be able to sit down for a week. And there was no laughter from the room, more the silent fear of listening in. At the end of the school day, Liesel walked home with Rudy and the other Steiner children, nearing Himmel Street in a hurry of thoughts. A culmination of misery swept over her. The failed recital of the grave digger's handbook, the demolition of her family, her nightmares, the humiliation of the day, and she crouched in the gutter and wept. It all led here. Rudy stood there next to her. It began to rain nice and hard. Kurt Steiner called out, but neither of them moved. One sat painfully now among the falling chunks of rain, and the other stood next to her, waiting. Why did he have to die? she asked, but still... Rudy did nothing. He said nothing. When finally she finished and stood herself up, he put his arm around her best buddy style, and they walked on. There was no request for a kiss, nothing like that. You can love Rudy for that if you like. Just don't kick me in the eggs. That's what he was thinking, but he didn't tell Liesel that. It was nearly four years later that he offered that information. For now, Rudy and Liesel made their way onto Himmel Street in the rain. He was the crazy one who had painted himself black and defeated the world. She was the book thief without the words. Trust me, though, the words were on their way, and when they arrived, Liesel would hold them in her hands like the clouds, and she would wring them out like the rain. We will end there.